I'm hungry. Give me tin. 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 I got it. I got it. You need more tin. Well, there you go, buddy. There's a fresh can for you. Oh, hi. You got me feeding my comic reading robot some tin. Hey, wait a minute. Comic books? Tin? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Folks, let's talk about DC Comics Metal Men starring their member Tin. Oh. Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. When I was young, a preteen, uh, my grandmother gave me some comics, some Tintin -tin comics. Now, my grandmother's family was from Sweden, and she was always very plugged into European art. She had read these Tintin -tin comics and thought that I would like them. She was right. Tintin always had great adventure. Its creator, Hergé, went on to influence generations of European artists with his unique art style. But he also had some deeply disturbing personal history during World War II. Today, let's take a look at Hergé's journey in creating Tintin and what makes that comic so special. Georges Rémy was born in 1907 in a municipality of Belgium's capital, Brussels. He loved drawing in the margins of his books in school. He attended a Cole St. Luke art school, but quit after one lesson because he found it boring. So most of his art education was self-taught. In 1925, he began his professional career as a cartoonist by drawing the comic strip The Adventures of Totor for the Boy Scouts magazine in Belgium. Remy gave himself the pen name Hergé, which was the French pronunciation of his initials reversed from GR to RG, Hergé. He continued to draw even after joining the military in 1927. Hergé illustrated the adventures of Totor until 1929, when he started what would become his best-known work, The Adventures of Tintin. It was a comic strip about a boy journalist who would travel the world tracking down a story with his loyal dog Snowy by his side. One of the most significant influences on Hergé's work was the American cartoonist Windsor McKay. Hergé loved cinema and had seen McKay's early animations. McKay was a pioneer of the comic strip medium, and his work, especially his strip Little Nemo in Slumberland, had a profound impact on Hergé. Hergé admired McKay's intricate, dreamlike illustrations, which often featured imaginative landscapes and surreal creatures. McKay's influence can be seen in Tintin's frequent dream sequences, as well as the fantastic and imaginative settings of many of the Tintin adventures. Another important influence was the French comic series Les Aventures de Zig et Puce, which played a role in inspiring Hergé's work. This series, created by Alain Senogon, was one of the first European comic strips to feature a continuous narrative and recurring characters. Hergé admired the way Saint-Ogon integrated humor and adventure into his stories, and he would go on to incorporate similar elements into the Tintin series. It's also possible that the earliest visuals of Hergé's Tintin could have been inspired by French illustrator Benjamin Rabier, who released a book called Tintin Lutine in 1889, which featured a young boy with a coif hairstyle and a friendly dog as his companion. I'm going to briefly explain the appeal of Tintin, what it did well, uh, and enjoy this part because after that we're going to talk about the influences on Tintin, the politics of the day, and that part's a little uglier, so enjoy this part while you can. The character of Tintin is very likable. He's a young reporter, brave, inquisitive, and resourceful. His adventures take him all over the world, so there's also an element of discovery. Because of Tintin's simple design, it's very easy for the reader to imagine themselves as Tintin. Over the course of the Tintin series, Hergé's storytelling evolved significantly, and he would go back and redraw things when the stories were collected into books. For instance, 
In Tintin's original visit to America, we see the direction of the action constantly shifting back and forth from left to right. In a revised version, Hergé makes the action clearly move from left to right. It's consistent. On top of that, his style is now confident in the accuracy of things like this horse is much better. The earliest Tintin adventures, such as Tintin in the Land of the Soviets and Tintin in the Congo, were heavily influenced by the political and social climate of the time. These stories were overtly political themselves. Hergé wanted his first story to feature Tintin going to America, but his editor insisted on a story set in Soviet Russia, mirroring the anti-Marxist, anti-socialist views of the paper in which it was published. Hergé did not have much time to research his first story set in Soviet Russia, and while the adventure aspects are fun, there are plenty of factual errors throughout, like the fact that this man is eating a banana in a time when Soviet Russia did not have access to those. In the second story, Tintin visits the Congo, and the story presents the occupying Belgian government as paternal and friendly, with the Congolese people glad to have the colonizers ruling them. While the comic was popular in Belgium at the time, in retrospect, the art of the Congolese people is racist, and they're presented as very simple-minded people. This story also originally glorified big game hunting, with Tintin drilling a hole in a rhinoceros and blowing it up with dynamite. This was later redrawn in the 1970s to remove such violence. A lot of the Tintin stories would get redrawn when they were published as books to keep up with the times and to keep the artwork consistent as Hergé developed his art style. As the series progressed, Hergé moved away from these more overtly political stories and began to focus more on adventure and mystery. Some of the most well-respected Tintin stories are the ones that were created in the middle period of Hergé's career. These stories which include The Crab with the Golden Claws, The Secret of the Unicorn, and Red Rackham's Treasure are fan favorites for their complex, well-plotted mysteries and their memorable characters. In particular, the character of Captain Haddock, who first appeared in The Crab with the Golden Claws, has become one of the most popular and enduring characters in the Tintin universe. One of the classic Tintin stories was The Blue Lotus, which featured more accurate attention to historical and cultural detail. This was thanks to Hergé's friendship with Zhang Shangren. Hergé met Zhang Shangren in the early 1930s, when Zhang was a Chinese student studying in Belgium. The two men met through a mutual friend and quickly struck up a close friendship. Hergé was fascinated by Zhang's knowledge of Chinese culture and language, and the two men spent many hours discussing Chinese literature, philosophy, and art. One of the most significant ways that Zhang Shangren influenced Hergé's work was through his introduction of Chinese calligraphy. Zhang taught Hergé about the art of Chinese brushwork and calligraphy, and this had a profound impact on the way Hergé approached drawing. Hergé began to incorporate careful brushwork into his drawings, including bold lines and brush strokes, and this helped to create a unique visual style that set his work apart from other comic book artists. Zhang also broadened Hergé's perspective of the world beyond Europe. One of the most distinctive aspects of Hergé's Tintin comics is his use of the Lean Claire drawing style. Lean Claire, which means clear line in French, is a method of drawing that emphasizes clean, clear lines and minimal shading. This style is particularly well suited to the Tintin stories as it allows Hergé to convey a great deal of detail and expression without overwhelming the reader with visual clutter. Artists influenced by Hergé's style include Dutch cartoonist Joost Zwarte, Belgian cartoonist Yves Chalon, and American comic book artist Chris Ware, among others. From Blue Lotus forward, the Tintin stories are consistently exciting. They're really paced fast for the adventure. They actually were coming out, of course, in comic strip format, and it sort of reminds me a little of manga these days. Really fast paced. Uh, I think that the Tintin stories from the 1930s forward feature great mysteries. They feature some great humor as well. 
But behind the scenes, Hergé was working for fascists. Hergé was hired by the abbot Norbert Wallès in 1928 to work on the children's supplement of the Belgian newspaper Le Ventième Siècle. At the time, Wallès was the editor-in-chief of the newspaper, and he was known for his conservative and Catholic views. Wallès was a strong supporter of the Catholic Party, which was the dominant political force in Belgium at the time. He used the newspaper as a platform to promote his conservative and religious views, and he often criticized liberal and socialist politicians in his editorials. In fact, Wallès was a fascist who even kept a photo of Mussolini on his desk. Wallès was close friends with Leon de Grel, the leader of the ultra-conservative Rexist party in Belgium. Leon was a Nazi collaborator, and he enrolled with the Belgian SS volunteers. He escaped to Spain when the war ended, and he never renounced being a Nazi. He also wrote a book where he argued that he was the inspiration for Tintin. He was probably full of shit. Despite his conservative politics, Wallace was also interested in promoting new and innovative forms of storytelling, and he recognized Hergé's talent as a cartoonist. He encouraged Hergé to create a new comic strip for the children's supplement, which eventually became The Adventures of Tintin. In 1940, after the German army invaded Belgium and occupied the country, Hergé began working for Le Soir, a Belgian newspaper that had been taken over by the Nazis. La Soie was a propaganda tool for the occupying forces and espoused a deeply anti-Semitic stance. However, Hergé continued to tell Tintin stories, and he kept his stories politically neutral. His first story at La Soie was The Crab with the Golden Claws, which introduced the grouchy but good-hearted Captain Haddock, as mentioned earlier. Tintin also morphed from a reporter to an adventurer. In the 1941 story, The Shooting Star, the world is threatened with a meteor, perhaps operating as a metaphor for the fears that Hergé had during World War II. On September 3rd, 1944, Belgium was liberated from Nazi control and La Soie was shut down. Hergé was arrested along with the entire editorial board of the paper. Fortunately for Hergé, he was released from jail after only one night because it was determined that his cartoon, aimed at children, was not political. Hergé's morality throughout the period has been called into question, but he never joined the Belgian Nazi party, Rex. Nevertheless, he was blacklisted through 1946 from working at Belgian newspapers. He was rejected when he applied to the popular Belgian comic magazine, Spiro, because of his past. So, in 1946, Hergé began publishing Tintin magazine, which would include Tintin stories and other comics. Hergé remained the creative director there through 1965. Hergé then continued to release Tintin stories through 1976 with his 23rd collected book called Tintin and the Picaros. While Hergé had questionable associations and his earliest Tintin books featured objectionable material, he did make an effort to keep his stories politically neutral at a time when his country was occupied by Nazi forces. And he updated many of his books throughout the years with new artwork to remove culturally insensitive material. At his core, I believe that Hergé wanted to make people happy. Hergé passed away in 1983 with one unfinished Tintin story that was published posthumously in 1986, Tintin and Alf Art with uh, fill-in artists. It's not as good as most of his other stuff. The best Tintin stories are the ones that mix adventure and comedy with a good mystery. Some of my recommendations, if you haven't read any Tintin stories, would be for just pure adventure, Destination Moon and Explorers on the Moon, a two volume story, that one's a lot of fun. Uh, for a good mix of comedy and adventure, uh, I guess I'd have to recommend The Red Sea Sharks, that one's really good. For the best personal stakes and just emotional drama, Tintin in Tibet is very, very good. And then I would say uh, a later book called Tintin and the Calculus Affair is arguably the most polished overall. Those are my thoughts on Tintin. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me and talk about a very well-beloved comic that has some 
awkward history behind it. And that's really putting it as gently as possible. I, I, I recognize that. But I do still love a lot of the Tintin stories. I read them when I was young before I could know any of the history about it, and they were a lot of fun. So I'll always thank my grandmother for introducing me to comics in that specific way. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you like this, please remember to hit things like like and subscribe and consider checking out my weekly live show on the channel Pros and Cons. That's on Mondays, 5 p.m. Pacific. I do about a two hour show riffing on the comic book news and comics that came out in the past week. That's a lot of fun. Thank you so much for watching. I'll be back really soon. Until then, you know what to do. Keep reading comics. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks. Hey everybody, it's Chris just jumping in to explain a little behind the scenes stuff. So I had actually recorded this full episode a week ago. If you hadn't heard, and the audio just came out totally bored. It turns out that the battery in the microphone had died. And it just came out hollow, tinny, muffled. Put it through a lot of filters. No go. Had to re-record it. But you know what? I honestly think that the script is a little better for it. I hope that this is one that you like. Uh, I would love to hear what European or Tintin specifically comics you have read and enjoyed. Like, put that in the comments below. I'll be reading those. Um, another thing that's delaying me a little bit is I am dealing with a, a lot of chronic pain in this shoulder uh, with an issue called adhesive capsulitis. Uh, it's very unpleasant. You can look it up. Uh, you can also look up frozen shoulder. It uh, should give you a match on what I'm dealing with. Uh, it just means that I've got very limited range of like mobility. Like I cannot raise my arm higher than that right now. It's very weak and it's very big. Constantly. So it means that I can't edit for as long as I used to. I have to take breaks. So I'm aiming to keep my show as weekly as possible, but just know that right now I am dealing with a physical problem. I've seen doctors for it. Uh, hopefully I can get it, you know, addressed faster. Sooner than later, I guess I should say. Uh, but I do also want you to just understand what's going on behind the scenes. It, it literally limits me from how much work I'm able to do at a time. Anyway, I really appreciate uh, you staying here till the end. Thank you for all the supporters on Patreon. That is what keeps this channel going. It means everything to me. Thank you all very much. See you real soon.